Alexa, what is the Church of Cannabis? That's probably nothing you'd ever imagine yourself asking your smart speaker, and yet, here we are. Cannabis has been used in spiritual practices for thousands of years, but in our modern age, Cannabis Church eh, feels like an excuse to smoke weed. My next guest became a marijuana advocate when a parody song that he wrote about the legalization of marijuana was put on the front page of a website for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. He later co-founded the International Church of Cannabis in Denver, Colorado on 4 <laughs> It's 15,000 members are not united by a singular God or anything like that. They actually categorize themselves as elevationists who use cannabis to elevate their lives. Today, he's going to give us a behind the scenes look at the congregation communing on the holy sacrament of weed and how it can be used as a spiritual tool. Cannabis capitalist, pot pastor, DARE program graduate, Steve Burke. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. That was such an NPR beautiful intro to, uh, to what we're doing. So uh, that, that, that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, I am, I know we just met, but I am a lady of paradoxes. So, you know, welcome, welcome to Meredith. This is what you get. Awesome. I'm looking forward to the interview. Well, I, I really love your accolades because they are also so paradoxical. We have, uh, let's see, stand-up comedian, former pro tennis player, two-time Miami Beach mayoral candidate, owner of a digital media company, YouTuber, reality TV star, rapper, uh, son of doctors, cannabis advocate. But of all these ad all these titles, pothead is not really one of them. So why not? Well, I don't know. My mom might argue with you. She loves throwing that term at me all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, not boring would be the way I would have it on my tombstone. Uh, you know, I never tried to go down the traditional path. And uh, here we are. I like not boring. Um, is it true that the first time that you ever smoked weed was with Richard Branson on his private island? The first time I smoked a spliff, uh, which was actually the first time I smoked tobacco or marijuana, was with Sir Richard Branson on Necker Island. And uh, at the time, I was still in my head a pro tennis player and uh, still kind of looked down at people who used cannabis. So that experience being with my entrepreneurial hero and, and, and smoking publicly with a bunch of people in a sort of celebratory fashion uh, did wonders to break the taboo of uh, cannabis use in my head. It's those paradoxes that really, uh, I think, give us a better perspective, which is actually what this show is all about, is expanding your perspective through curiosity and not putting people in a very limited box. And it's funny because now in hindsight, uh, a lot of my um, role models in tennis, I found out later were regular cannabis users. So people that I thought were so serious and uh, so professional in their careers actually were regularly using cannabis just in the closet because, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, very few people were uh, in public, you know, admitting that they were cannabis users. That's so true. And that's what I have found too, is not everyone that, you know, looks a certain way is a pothead and not everyone that, you know, you just never know what's going on behind the scenes. So it's, it's easier to, it's better to ask questions than just assume. And some people use it, you know, medicinally. And I think that's part of your story as well. What was the bridge between <laughs> smoking with Richard Branson on TV uh, to exploring cannabis as a pain management tool? Yeah, I, I definitely was a medical patient first, then activist, then recreational user. Um, you know, I had a, a, a severe back injury that ended my tennis career in 2003, 2004. And, you know, it was two years of not being able to sleep through the night without pain that, uh, you know, got me experimenting with cannabis for pain management. And, you know, I'd gone through all the traditional paths, uh, you know, like, like you mentioned earlier, I'm the son of two doctors. 
So I, I, you know, had the epidural injections. I had the facet injections. I went as far as acupuncture and chiropractors and nothing really helped. And I didn't want to develop an addiction to uh, opioids and, and really strong prescription pain medication. And that's when I started experimenting with, with medical marijuana. And uh, I noticed, you know, improved uh, uh, results. And, you know, that kind of got me questioning our government and questioning everything as, as to what I was taught. You know, I was a child in the 80s and the 90s, and I went through the DARE program and I was taught all drugs are bad, okay? And, uh, and when I started questioning why we have a plant medicine that seems to work for me and anecdotally work for, you know, thousands of other people, um, you know, I, 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 you know, basically became this YouTube cannabis activist, uh, making music video parodies, promoting the legalization of marijuana. And that kind of put me on the map as this national cannabis activist. And you kind of like to, I mean, from what I've observed online, so you tell me if this is accurate or not, I feel like you kind of like to conduct mm, social experiments a little bit. I saw the video at the Miami Art Basel where you were selling art from your trench coat. Um, so at some level was founding the International Church of Cannabis like a hybrid of wanting to be a cannabis activist, but also like, mm, this is an interesting experiment. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, I guess I have a propensity for trailblazing and pioneering new ideas. And, you know, when I ran for mayor of Miami Beach in 2011, I ran as a YouTube comedian. And at the time, it was an unprecedented campaign, which is why it attracted international uh, media attention. I was on the front page of the New York Times. I was in newspapers in China, Japan, Italy, France. I mean, Programs from all over the world were covering this crazy, you know, pothead comedian that was running a campaign for the mayorality of Miami Beach, but it didn't seem to be 100% serious. But at the same time, I, 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 I had traction. I was, I, you know, I, I, I nearly won, uh, you know, I wouldn't say nearly won, but I, I had a respectable 30% of the vote uh, on election day running against a two-time incumbent. And it was that unorthodox trailblazing campaign, um, ironically, with a unusual campaign advisor who ended up becoming the campaign advisor for President Trump in his first campaign. Um, it was it was this unusual approach to politics and life in general that, uh, you know, kind of led me down this path. And I don't think founding or co-founding the International Church of Cannabis was done deliberately because it was a unique uh, bucking the establishment type of uh, experiment, as you so called it. But it was it certainly was attractive to me in that it never been done before. There's never been a church and, you know, there still isn't uh, a church that you can legally consume cannabis in. So we're the first and we're still the first and only uh, church in the world that allows its congregation to consume cannabis during services. But that wasn't the um, reason why we did it. And it kind of just happened organically. It was never the goal to create a church of cannabis. It just kind of happened by accident. And why, why a church? Why not a club or a, like a bar or like, you know, like a hookah lounge, but for we or like a, you know, or like a group or like a, a, a men's club or something like that. Well, the reason is because of the property itself. Uh, you know, I, am a real estate investor and uh, and my parents or my mom specifically always had a romantic idea of converting an old church into a home. There's something about the high ceilings and the stained glass and the architecture. And so I had been looking at churches for sale for years uh, and never found the right one. And um, as you mentioned, I started a uh, cannabis digital media company and I happened to be in Denver, Colorado uh, for the High Times Cannabis Cup. And for those that don't know, High Times, the magazine, the one from the 70s, threw these cannabis cups in Colorado that at the time, I didn't realize how revolutionary they were, but it was just giant festival of 
people smoking weed and doing dabs and in front of police and, and, and there was no um, threat of prosecution. And I went in 2014 because I wanted to see it firsthand and I wanted to cover it for my, my media company. And uh, at the time we had a, um, an influencer that we had signed to our company who uh, was a YouTuber that smoked weed daily on YouTube and just talked about life. <laughs> and uh, I met him for breakfast at this little famous breakfast spot in Denver called Lucille's Creole Cafe. And we had breakfast there in the morning. And after breakfast, I drove down Logan Street, which um, had a giant church for sale. There was a big sign in front that said for sale. And I was curious and I called up the number on the sign and I said, how much? And they said 1.3 million asking price. And it was a massive property. And I was like, that seems like not very much money for such a big, big property. And I looked into it. I scheduled a, a viewing. And uh, the original idea in, in buying this old church was as a real estate investment to turn it into condos or at the very worst to turn it into a sick mega mansion for some professional athlete in Denver that would think it's cool to live in a church. Hmm. Okay. That is not at all what I expected you to say. That's interesting. Well, I mean, I truth be told, I mean, we, I bought this property not to make a church of cannabis. I, I bought this property as a real estate investment to turn it into a single family residence or a multifamily apartment building. And uh, the church sat vacant for a year after we purchased it. And it was only when my startup cannabis digital media company, which was based in my garage uh, in the house that I'm currently sitting in, um, it was when we worked as a company on Florida's medical marijuana uh, referendum. And we tried to pass medical marijuana in 2014 in the state of Florida. And it failed by just one and a half points. And no. after it failed, <laughs> our, uh, our company and all of our employees, we looked at each other like, well, there's going to be no legal cannabis in Florida for at least two years, maybe longer. What are we doing here? You know, you, you own a church in Denver where there's this robust recreationally legal cannabis market. Why don't we just go live in the church and, you know, meet people in the industry and, and, and just move our company there. And it was that uh, epiphany that, hey, you know, we have this empty sitting property there. I'm not doing anything with it right now. 30 days later, we all moved. We were all living in this church together. There were six or seven of us. And um, as we were living in the church, um, working on our, you know, cannabis videos and, you know, digital media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff, we were like, well, what are, what are we going to do with this church? We don't need a 13,000 square foot office for a six person company. Um, what should we do? And all of the uh, members of our company came from different religious backgrounds and faiths. And we, we thought, what if we formed a new church that wasn't uh, dogmatic, that was not bound by a single um, book or, uh, you know, dogma. And instead, the common thread that bound the community together was the fact that we all use cannabis in our spiritual journeys. And so we looked into what it's like to create a 501c3 religious organization. We consulted with some attorneys and poof, we founded Elevationism. That's so cool. Okay. So tell me about your members, because when I think about mm, a church of cannabis in Denver, Colorado, I think about disheveled hippies who are really happy and nice who smell like patchouli is that like the archetype or is it a little bit broader yeah it's, we have a really diverse congregation uh, members as young as 21 and members as old as mid 80s and uh, we have members who are religious and go to their regular church every single sunday and we have members that are agnostic and atheist or buddhist or jewish uh I remember the first time we threw a, um, a Passover Seder and we had 70 people show for our Bob Marley themed oh my gosh. cannabis infused Passover Seder. And um, it was it was great. We celebrate all the holidays at our church, Jewish holidays, Christian holidays. We even celebrated Festivus and, and uh, 
We've celebrated <laughs> Festivus every year for the past several years. I'll be right over. No. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I love it. Um, so how does a person become a member of your church? Yeah, so it's really easy. Um, you go to our website, which if you Google International Church of Cannabis, it's the first site that comes up, or you can go to elevationists.org. And uh, there is a join button at the top of the website. You fill out a questionnaire and you fill out the questions correctly. You get approved for membership and you become uh, on our email list. You, you're on our email list where you will get the invitations to all of our uh, events and services. And what do the services look like? You, do you have like a Sunday morning service? Are there small groups? So services pre-COVID and post-COVID are quite different. Uh, before COVID, we had services every single week, uh, Sunday evenings generally, and services consist of a different guest speaker and a different musical guest every week. So no two services were the same. Uh, the best way to describe it is think uh, TED Talks meets MTV Unplugged. Um, so, and you're allowed to bring your own cannabis into the church and consume. So we don't sell weed. We don't provide you with any weed. Uh, before COVID, I mean, everybody shared and passed joints around in the chapel. Uh, after COVID, that's not happening. We, we, we strongly advise against people passing joints around. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, you know, services are less frequent now than they used to be. We do, we're focusing more on quality over quantity. And, uh, and because I'm no longer living full-time in Denver and uh, neither are any of our co-founders, it's a little bit more, you know, once a month, once every four to six weeks, and we throw a great service where our members can, uh, can come. And is there any plans to expand into multiple campuses? That's kind of, you know, the mm, business plan of most modern churches is just plant one church and then expand to other campuses. Is that your plan or is it just going to stay the one church? Well, it, it, it wasn't the original plan. Uh, we just wanted to have a church and have a, a, a safe place for adults who use cannabis in their spiritual journey to have a home, to have a place where they could feel safe consuming the sacrament and praying if that's what they do or, you know, being spiritual. Um, now that the church is successful, and when I say successful, I mean able to financially support itself. Now, the first couple of years, we had no business model. And, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you created this church to be tax exempt and to, uh, to not have to pay taxes. I'm like, yeah, but you need revenues to not pay taxes. Like, where are our revenues coming from, you know? So we had no, I mean, donations were, you know, maybe a hundred dollars a week, and that's not enough to pay your electric bill or your gas bill. So, uh, you know, since the church created the beyond guided meditation and laser light show, and that's become such a large attraction in Denver. It's one of the top tourist attractions. Now in Denver, we're open seven days a week. We do a show every single hour. Um, since that show was created, we now are sustainable and we're successful and we can now pay salaries and pay our staff and no longer just be a volunteer based church. And now that we have a proven business model, we are looking to expand into other cities. We're currently working on a Miami campus right now, and uh, hopefully we'll have one in New York someday, one in LA, one in Amsterdam, one in Barcelona, but you know, baby steps one at a time. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that Denver is now able to support a small staff and create jobs and, uh, and have better quality of speakers and services and musical guests and comedy shows. Um, you know, we are hoping to expand soon, uh, but we haven't secured our next location yet. Um, that's totally exciting though. I, I can't wait to hear what's next. You mentioned, um, spiritual journey and cannabis. I didn't, I didn't realize that throughout history, cannabis has been used for spiritual practices until preparing for our talk. And it's in, um, in Hinduism, it's listed as one of the five sacred plants in the Vedas. I didn't even realize it was mentioned in the Christian Bible. Um, the Uyghur Muslims in China use it. I had no clue. So I was curious if you knew of any of the positive effects of 
specifically cannabis use for the members of your congregation? Do you have any like testimonies? Well, for the, and this is a kind of a major facet of elevationism is that elevationism is unique to your personal journey. We don't tell you how to go down that journey. We don't tell you when to smoke, how to consume, whether it's smoking, eating it, vaping it. Um, we don't tell you how often. We don't tell you which God to, to, to pray to. We don't even tell you, you know, we, we're, what makes us unique as a religion is that we don't pretend to know the answers to life's great questions. So elevationism is really about your individual spiritual journey. And that is left for you to interpret and for you to experience on your own. Um, we try to bring in a diverse uh, array of speakers to share their experiences with our congregation and hope that our congregation can learn a nugget of wisdom from every single speaker. But there's, you know, anecdotally, sure, I've heard tons of our members tell us how it helps them on their journey, how they found themselves, how they've been able to be more understanding, patient, uh, you know, all the positive effects uh, of, of cannabis. Um, however, we don't have a, a, a unifying um, way or, 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 or kind of practice of elevationism. It's really up to you and your individual journey. And what about you? Do you have any specific examples of how cannabis has helped you spiritually? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the idea of elevationism is how to be the best version of you. It's about elevating yourself to a better version of self. Cannabis has helped me be a better person. And, and so, you know, the, the one golden rule that we have in elevationism is treat others how you want to be treated. It's the golden rule. It's very simple, right? So it's helped me be more kind, more patient, uh, more forgiving, uh, more understanding. And it's helped me think outside the box. I didn't really start doing stand-up comedy until I started smoking weed. Really? Um, I didn't become a successful entrepreneur until I tapped into portions of my brain and problem solving that I was not able to tap into before I became a cannabis user. So, hmm. you know, that's one of the things that, you know, Richard Branson taught me is, is think outside the box. And, you know, he was a, instrumental in my breaking down the square confines of my entrepreneurial thinking. And, uh, you know, look at the church of cannabis. It's something completely unique. It's something that never would have been created if I hadn't experimented with, uh, you know, cannabis use. And um, so for me, it has turned me into a better Steve Burke. And that's what elevationism is all about, is being the best version of you possible. I love that. I can definitely share that sentiment of uh, marijuana making me a better version of myself. So definitely uh, experiencing different aspects of my mental state that I realize I can tap into even while sober to some extent. So it is really a great launching point for, as you said, creativity and for me being present and yeah, all kinds of things. I'm curious what you think about in the cannabis industry in general. I'm sure you've seen that dispensaries are kind of leaning towards stronger products. Um, like the mellow stuff isn't really, it's kind of hard to find, you know, it's, it's getting stronger and stronger. And I'm wondering if you feel like this could be an error uh, to the benefit of cannabis being all those things you just said, and instead ex exchanging it for a one dimensional escape of just getting stoned. Yeah, I do think it's an error, actually. I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Um, you know, in Colorado, there's a very, you know, very evolved recreational market. And I would say, uh, over the past five years, the percentage of market share of uh, dabs and shatter and wax has grown and the percentage of flour has, has, has gone down uh, as far as market share is concerned. And um, in order for cannabis to be accepted in the mainstream, I think 
uh, cannabis users need to be very uh, cognizant of perception, right? Perception, how we're perceived by the soccer mom that's in Ohio that's worried about their kid getting hooked on drugs, right? And when you have like dab rigs with blow torches and people heating up these things of wax, like I'm not saying that wax isn't good for some people. Some people may need stronger levels of THC, but the perception to somebody who's not familiar with cannabis is you look like a crackhead, right? And so we were very, very aware of being new as a church and being perceived negatively in the media and how that could really defeat or harm our mission. Our mission is to normalize cannabis and spirituality. So we do not allow dab rigs inside the church during our services because it's a bad look. And we don't, you know, condemn anybody for using dabs or for, you know, uh, consuming wax or shatter or highly concentrated THC. But in order to make this movement more appealing to, you know, listen, you know, yes, we've uh, leaps and bounds in America as far as cannabis, but look at Europe, you know, look at Eastern European countries that are, you know, and look at Asia. In order for this to become globally recognized, everybody always looks at America as the leader. But if, you know, if, if 2020 or 60 Minutes is doing a story on weed and they show these people with these, you know, blow torches and, you know, you, I've seen people do a dab and their eyes roll into the back of their head and pass out. I've seen it. The first time I did dabs, it was way too strong for me. And uh, so I do think it's important uh, for the perception of the cannabis user to become normalized. And I do think the highly concentrated THC is bad for business and, uh, and bad for the normalization of the industry. I would agree with you 100%. I actually think lights would be a great, like, you know, like Marlboro lights, like there needs to be like yeah. light weeks. Okay. But, you know, Steve, this is your next assignment. Um, yeah, I need to I'm, see I'm it. On it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, because I think you know, the idea of having, uh, you know, I have a couple friends who have no tolerance, but they want to be outside smoking a joint with their friends. Yeah. But they take one hit and they're and they're high. Exactly. So can we make a, a a joint that is you know one fifth or one tenth the strength so that they can smoke the whole joint? but it'd be the equivalent of one or two hits off of a 20% or 25% THC strain weed. Yes. Thank you. That is, let me know. <laughs> let me know when you make that because we've, I live in Pensacola, Florida. It's a, I think we got like, uh, I don't know, we'll say 40,000 people in our population. And I think we have eight dispensaries. That feels like a lot. And I I'm for it. I love the variety, but um, almost none of them carry low THC products, um, which is at, at the beginning they did. And that is what I began to love because it really helps me stay focused and it helps quiet my busy mind. And now I have to make my own with CBD. I get from the vitamin shop because the, the weed stores don't even sell regular CBD. And then I have to mix it with the THC drops. And so it's like, okay, now I have to do this at home in my kitchen. Uh, it'd be so nice to just have the equivalent of, you know, uh, one of those seltzer beers, but in weed. And so I could hang out with my friends and it's not me worrying that I'm going to overdo it and be the one that's like too high to participate in conversation. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the industry right now is catering to very regular users. Eventually as it opens up, there's going to have to be some entry level products because you're not going to have people continuing to experiment with cannabis if they get too high their first couple of times and have negative experiences. So uh, I'd love to see the market eventually address that hole in the industry. And I think it will, I think, you know, capitalism, they'll find a way. Um, but uh, you know, right now you're seeing a shift in going after people who consume a lot of cannabis and they just want higher and higher levels of, of THC. And I, I don't necessarily think that's, you know, I think everything needs balance, yeah. right? You know, one glass of wine a day, super healthy for your heart. Nine glasses of wine a day, you might be an alcoholic. So, you know, you need to find the yin and the yang. And uh, I think it's very important, not just with uh, cannabis, but with anything, you know, too much sugar, too much, you know, sex, too much uh, exercise, anything in one direction or the other, it can be unhealthy. Well, maybe if you write a parody song and put it on YouTube, you know, 
that's the beginning, right? Yeah, that's my, my previous life. <laughs> As we wrap up, will you tell people where they can stay in touch with the church, how they can visit and stay in touch with all of your many not boring endeavors? Well, um, the best way to stay in touch and uh, uh, follow what the church is doing is to just go to our website, elevationist.org, or just Google International Church of Cannabis. Uh, join our email list. You'll get awesome emails. We, we do monthly comedy shows. We do yoga. We do all kinds of special events and fun things. And, um, and uh, eventually, uh, we, we might you know, start broadcasting our services on YouTube and Facebook. We're not quite there yet. Um, but yeah, you know, we're online, we're on Instagram at, at church of cannabis. We're on Facebook. Uh, if you find us on Facebook, we're there and, uh, you know, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll be coming to a city near you. Hey, you're still here. That's awesome. I hope to see you next week too. I talk with the most interesting people that you've probably never heard of. Most of them are paradoxical and bring an opportunity for you to grow as a person. So if you like bright, meaningful entertainment, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.